Our first speaker this morning is uh, Samuel Sturgeon. Uh, Sam is a senior research manager at Bonneville Communications and is the president and director of Research of Demographics uh, Intelligence, uh, a firm that provides demographic information, analysis, and consulting, and conducts research on marriage and fertility trends in the United States. Uh, demographic Intelligence was founded by uh, W. Bradford Wilcox, director of the National Marriage Pro uh, Project and founder of the Institute for Family Studies, and also our second speaker today. Uh, Sam has done extensive demographic research in several capacities, including the research department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, he received his doctorate in human development and family studies and demography from Penn State University. He's married and has four children. So join me in welcoming Sam. Well, thank you to the Wheatley Institution for the invitation to speak with you today. And basically what I'd like to talk to you about is we hear a lot of times in the news these ideas that the family's declining families going down, families aren't doing as well as they used to. So I kind of want to give a general sense of the evidence of what do we know about this? What does that mean when we say families are declining? What does that even look like day to day? So just to kind of tell you what we're going to talk about, I want to begin by just giving you an overview of kind of the role that families play in society. We're going to look at some of the evidence of family decline. We're going to look especially at where the family is declining. Then I'm going to talk briefly about causes of family decline. And then I want to have a brief kind of presentation of why this matters, why we care, why we should worry about this. And then I want to finish with some reasons for optimism. So, and then we'll have, as Jason mentioned, kind of a, a Q&A. So I want to begin with a few cautionary notes, though this probably isn't the right title for this slide. But... Uh, this is the main point of what I'm going to talk about. So if you know this already, you're free to go. But this is what I'm going to present today, is basically that the decline in families is measurable, ongoing, and has real effects on society at large, especially children. So, but now to get to the cautionary notes, I'm a demographer. We tend to focus on general trends. And almost any slide I present, you could probably say, well, I know someone that fits that profile, and that's just not true of their life. And I would probably agree with you, right? So I just want to say we're looking at general trends. You're always going to be able to find exceptions to these trends, and that's true. But keep that in mind, that I'm looking at the population as a whole and what happens with that population. My parents got divorced. I'm the product of being raised by a single mother, so I understand that, that you know, things aren't necessarily deterministic. And the last point I want to make is I'm going to show you some group differences but a lot of times when I present, some people will come up afterwards and they'll say, your presentation's kind of mean. You made a lot of people feel bad. Kids don't choose what family they're born into, and now you're telling them that because of something they didn't choose, that they're likely to face these differential outcomes. And I just want to make the point that I don't consider that mean. I hope that you wouldn't consider that mean. So if someone comes to you and says it's mean to talk about these things, that you're able to say, well, well, I actually think it's more mean to ignore them, right? To just say that we've got subsets of society that are having a really hard time, but we don't want to talk about it because it's mean, right? So I will say, though, what is mean is to meet somebody and say, oh, you were raised by a single mom, therefore we can expect that you're not as good as everybody else. That is mean, right? But I think looking at general trends, I just want to keep that in mind that I think that's one of the arguments we face is people say to point these things out is it's just mean and we don't need to do it but but I'm gonna hope that you're in a mindset where you say that, that that's okay you, you can talk about this without without being a jerk or at least that's my hope let me know afterwards if you feel like I was a jerk but uh, but that's where we're gonna start so let's begin with family and society so traditionally or historically the traditional family's been called the fundamental unit of society. You hear that a lot, and there's a reason for that. Families perform several societal responsibilities and functions, though I think we'd have to argue that in modern times, the role of the family in society has changed. 
So I like to think of the family as like this giant redwood tree. It's sort of this pillar that you can see from far off. It provides stability, but there's also a lot of branches to that tree, and each of these branches represents something that the family does. So I apologize if this feels like Family Studies 101, but I want to give you this important context so that when we talk about the decline in family, you can begin to see that a lot of the functions that families have played, we've had to replace with other institutions. So one of those is regulating sexuality. Families did a great job, not only with the incest taboo and other things, but helping us to know who can pair up, right? And when's an appropriate age to pair up? That families really, really did protect and regulate sexuality. Producing the next generation, this is, this still is the responsibility of families, but that's just something to keep in mind that it really is, it's families at the end of the day that produce the next generation. Defining kinship. So this is a useful societal role. Who gets, when someone dies, who gets their estate? Well, it gets passed on to the family. So there's some kind of critical things here. Educating and socializing children. Again, at the end of the day, yes, we have public schools, but manners and all these other, how do you survive in society? That's largely mom and dad. Siblings, aunts and uncles that are giving a lot of the training for educating and socializing children. Caring for the elderly. Throughout generations, this has been a family responsibility. And you still see that today. Who has primary responsibility you know, for grandma and grandpa if they become infirm? It's still largely families. Producing the necessities of life, right? Now this is another one that's shifted, but still at the end of the day, it's families that make sure that especially young children and the vulnerable get what they need. So with that, the, the distribution of goods and services. Even when you look at a state with social welfare programs, they still send the checks to a family and a family decides how are these things gonna be used, right? or it's families that make purchasing decisions, things like that. And then lastly, providing safety and emotional support, that's another family role. Now what's happened is slowly over time, a lot of these roles have kind of changed or been diminished. And that's something that's important to think about. And I especially think with a lot of our college students, they have a very narrow time frame that in their lifetime, things may have been this way. But we've got people in this room that can say, boy, in my childhood, it wasn't this way. This is a very recent shift, a very recent change. And so if you look at, and not all these changes have necessarily been bad. For example, I think of defining kinship. We've weakened kinship ties, but I can tell you, I'm grateful that I'm not going to inherit my uncle's debts, right? Because he's had a, a bit of some, tr some struggles. I may have in the past, right? But if you look at each of these, educating and socializing children, we've now got the public schools that have largely taken over that responsibility for good and bad. Uh, producing the necessities of life, right? We're not an agrarian society where families are working on farms and producing our own food. That's been changed with the modern economy, but that is a fundamental shift. So I just, when you look at these roles, just think about how they've changed over time, that these are things that families used to do that they don't necessarily do due to technology, due to a modern economy, due to a hundred other reasons. But it's just important to think about that there's a reason the family's always been the fundamental unit of society. They take care of these things, but that's been diminished over time. So a couple reasons for this. One, society's kind of adopted a soulmate model of marriage which focuses much more on the needs of the adults as opposed to children. So this is people saying, I just need to find the love of my life. Or married adults saying, you know, we've kind of fallen out of love. I'm not personally satisfied with this or my needs aren't being met. Maybe we get a divorce. Well, that, we have to look at that and say, this is much more of an adult focused arrangement now than it was historically when there was more focus on children. Marriage is now viewed as more of a capstone to life than a cornerstone. So marriage is what you do when you've got a job, you've got an education, you own a house. It's kind of the pinnacle to say, hey, I've arrived. Life is good. It wasn't always that way. Marriage used to kind of be the cornerstone of setting up your adult life. So that's, that's something worth keeping in mind because again, this is a social change. This is an interesting one that again, I think younger people might not understand, but families are increasingly focused on consumption 
rather than production. And what do I mean by that? What do families do when they get together? They eat and they play, right? That's what family gatherings are for. That hasn't always been the case in, in our history. That for a long time, families would get together largely to produce. And we don't do barn raisings and we don't do things like that as often anymore. But that's something to think about too. That when you describe family time nowadays, you're really talking about consumption and you're no longer talking about a unit of production. That's a substantial shift over time. And what I kind of like to say is we're witnessing sort of a hollowing out of the family. And what do I mean by this? Well, if we go back to our redwood tree kind of example, the family's still there. It's still alive. But much of those functions have been hollowed out. And I would even argue right now that if we still had kind of the family institution that we had before, we wouldn't be having these discussions regarding same-sex marriage and other issues. Because what happens is people can say, wow, you've changed the institution of marriage so much that we fit now. We belong. As long as you're defining marriage as simply the public recognition of a commitment between two consenting adults, it's hard to argue that certain groups don't belong in that, as long as that's the definition that we've adopted, right? If we've hollowed out kind of a lot of the meaning regarding children. So to me, that's just something worth thinking about that I wouldn't argue, for example, that same-sex groups themselves have damaged marriage, that marriage itself has kind of withered over time, and they're seizing the opportunity, right? And that's important to think about. So what is the evidence of family decline? And I apologize if this feels like a data dump, but I want to show you facts and figures that demonstrate how we can measure this decline. So some evidence of that is fewer people marry. So here are marriages per 1,000 unmarried women age 15 and over. And you see that there's been a pretty steady decline. The marriage rate now is less than half of what it was in the 1970s. More people cohabit. We've seen an exponential growth in cohabitation as, as kind of the norm. So you'll see in a minute, we've seen an increase in the age at which people marry, but we haven't seen much of an increase in the age at which people first pair up, right, for their kind of their first committed sexual union. So largely, cohabitation is growing. It's becoming more the norm. In fact, it's even talked about as that's the smart thing to do right, is to kind of experiment. Are we compatible? Can we figure this out? So like I said, people marry later. Here's the median age at which men and women in the US now get married. And in a lot of urban areas, this median age is now north of 30 for men. So you can see that people are putting off marriage longer and longer. Okay, more people never marry. Now, in demographic terms, I don't want to depress anybody in the room uh, that might fit this demographic. But usually, if you haven't married by about age 40 or 45, the odds that you will later marry are, are pretty low. So we can kind of look at then a snapshot of what's the percentage of people, 40 to 45, that, are, that have never married. And that's going to kind of be pretty close to the lifetime statistic. So what you see is this huge growth in people age 40 to 44 that have never married, both men and women. So we are going to have a much larger percent of the population that goes their entire lives having never married. Uh, in opinions, right, so we've now crossed the threshold in the US where more than half of adults now approve or at least favor somewhat same-sex marriage. Now I would qualify this a little bit. If you make it dichotomous, do you favor or oppose, you tend to get results where the majority favor. But if you give them kind of a I'm not sure option, that becomes a pretty large group as well. So again, that's something to kind of think about, that people are not sure, but definitely the society is moving in the direction of majority favorability. It's the same with attitudes about premarital, premarital sex. So this is the percent of adults that say, hey, this is not at all wrong. North of 50% of adults just say, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's ever wrong right, versus a, sm a smaller minority, less than a third, that say, you know, this is always wrong. So again, you can see this is a fairly big shift in American society. Another shift we see is people have fewer children. 
Now this slide goes way back to the 1800s because I want to point out, this isn't necessarily a recent phenomenon, but over time you have this big exception that's kind of the baby boom there, but this is the total fertility rate or the average number of children a woman could be expected to have over her lifetime, right, throughout the, the past 140 years or so. And again, you just sort of see, we're not unique in this in America. Every modern country, in fact, even developing countries are now experiencing this, but you are seeing an overall decline in fertility. We're seeing a lot more unmarried parents. So back in 1960, only about one in 20 children were born out of wedlock. Now we're close to two out of five children now are born to unmarried parents. This is quite a substantial shift in America. And again, you can see this represented in attitudes where back in the 60s and even the 70s, childbearing was considered largely what married parents do. Now that's not the case. You see it in our popular media and other things, people talking about, well, it's okay, you don't have to be, you don't have to be married. So what we then see is fewer children live with two parents. So this is, now remember, this data is cross-sectional. At any point in time, what percent of children under age 18 are living with two married parents? Now what's remarkable about this statistic is some kids will be born to cohabiting parents who will then marry. Other kids will live with married parents who then divorce. But if you look at the aggregate across the life course, again, because between, between 40 and 50% of marriages are expected to end in divorce, we've now crossed the threshold where less than half of children today are, are expected to live with two married parents from birth to age 18. So this is now the minority experience of children to say that I lived with two married parents my entire childhood. And that's a pretty striking change to now realize that that's no longer the majority experience, right? Now this statistic here on between 40 to 50 percent of marriages ending in divorce, um, it's a lot of difficulty in calculating that. That's why I say there's a pretty wide ban there. And divorce rates have actually come down recently, so marriages are getting a little more successful. That's perhaps some good news. But it's still relatively high that people that are marrying still face pretty good odds that they won't be married for the rest of their lives. So looking at attitudes, this is the percentage of adults who agree that one parent can bring up a child as well as two parents together. Now I don't know how many of people taking this survey actually believe this versus just kind of say that seems like the politically correct thing to say, but there's still going to be a large portion that say, yeah, one is just as good as two. Now I think this is a statistic or an idea that's worth challenging because how many things do you know of in your life where one is just as good as two, right? Where one person can perform the job just as good as two, but you have now right about half of adults in America saying, yeah, I think a, I think a single parent can do just as well as two parents. That's pretty striking. Right? When you start to add up all the things that parents are expected to do, to me it's just hard to believe. Make the case that one can do as well as two. I don't know how you even begin to make that case. right? Because there's trade-offs all over the place. Yet we've got half of adults here saying, I, I think one parent is just as good as two. Uh, now we've, we've kind of tracked sort of these overall trends, right? In declines in marriage, declines in children living with parents, declines in fertility overall. But it's really important to ask, especially for me as a demographer, well, where is family declining? Does every family face the same odds of divorce? Does every family, does every child kind of face the same odds of living without his parents? Well, the answer to that is no. But I, I want to show you some data here. So this is the percentage of families, and these are families with children, headed by two parents by income quintile. So we divide the population up into fifths, the bottom fifth through the top fifth. And what you see is that in 1970, there was a little bit of an income gradient for households with children. That the vast majority, right, over 90% of the top 80% were households, married households. But you see a little bit of decline in the bottom quintile. 
Now we fast forward 40 years, and you see that at the top here, marriage is still relatively strong, but we've had a pretty substantial decline in marriage, and especially the bottom 20%, where only about a third of those households are headed by married couples, but then we're down to about 70% in the second quintile. Now why does this matter? Because most of the people writing journal articles, most of the elites that are talking about this, they're here. They're following this model that's very traditional. They marry, they wait till they're married to have their children, but then their rhetoric is very different. Their rhetoric is, well, don't judge. Who are we to judge? It's okay to have a child out of wedlock. Though none of them are do well, very few of them are doing that in their personal lives, right? So we have this interesting dynamic where family attitudes have switched. So just as another uh, example of this, now this chart, I apologize, is really confusing, but I don't know how else to display this data. So just pay attention that triangles are gonna be the median age at first birth, and circles are gonna be the median age at first marriage, right? So the point when 50% of individuals do this, and this is for women. So you look at college graduates, women that have graduated college, you can see that they're both delaying childbirth and delaying marriage. But on average, the birth of their first child is coming about two years after their marriage on average. So they're largely waiting until they're married and they're waiting into their, into their 30s now on average to have that first child. But the first child almost always comes after marriage. Let's go to middle America, those with a high school diploma or some college, you can see that throughout history, they've had children a little earlier than the college graduates have. They've married a little earlier than the college graduates have. But we had this crossover at about 2000, where childbirth started to become before marriage on average, right? So they are delaying marriage more, but they've kind of stopped delaying childbearing. And then we go to the lowest educated, those with less than a high school diploma. And what you see is they've always had children on average before they've married. The problem is not only are they delaying marriage, fewer and fewer of them are ever getting married. So this isn't just kind of a delay in age. It may never happen now. And they've had children much younger. So what I want you to think about, think about the children that grow up in these environments. The children with the college educated mothers, they have a father in the home. And odds are, super high, that that father also has a college degree. Children in the middle, dad may or may not have a college degree. Dad probably doesn't have as successful a job, doesn't have the economic resources. And he may not be there, right? Because higher rates of divorce, other things. And then down here, dad may not be in the picture at all. And if dad's there, if they are married, he probably doesn't have a college degree and as stable an employment. So you begin to look at this and you say, wow, these are kids that grow up in three different worlds, right? So on the left, these are kids that are probably in really nice zip codes with fantastic schools. Kids here are in less reputable zip codes with you know, more challenging schools. So you can kind of see that these advantages will accumulate over the life course of a child. And again, this is a child that didn't choose the arrangement he was born into. But I think we have to look at this and say, wow, we have huge disparities among children's opportunities in America. And one thing that predicts a lot of those disparities are the family formation behaviors of his parents. At what time do they have child, children? Who do they have children with? And do they do it while married? So here's a chart that just kind of explains this. Let's look at first births by education status. So again, college graduates, it's growing, but only 12% of children born to college educated women are born out of wedlock. And other analyses I've done shows that the majority of those are born to cohabiting couples who will go on and marry, right? So second and later births born to college educated women, a very small percentage of those are out of wedlock. It's like three or four percent of second and later births to college educated women. So you can see this is, this is a different trajectory. Then we go to middle educated America, and this is what I was telling you about. They've now crossed the threshold 
where the majority of women with a high school diploma or some college, the majority now will have their first child out of wedlock, 58% of first births to women in the middle education group. And then lastly, the less than high school group, the vast majority, right? What would that be? Uh, six out of seven, roughly, or five out of six of their first children are born out of wedlock. And most of their subsequent births are also out of wedlock. So this to me is a fascinating attitudinal slide. This comes from the National Survey of Family Growth. But this is adults ages 25 to 44 who agree that marriage has not worked out for most people I know. So think about that. That's an incredibly high bar to say marriage has not worked out for most people I know. Well, college graduates, one in five, say, yeah, marriage hasn't worked out for most people I know. The high school some college group, two out of five, say marriage has not worked out for most people I know. Now you get to the less than high school, half of them, or over half, are saying marriage has not worked out for most people that I know. What incentive would they have to marry? Right? If they're in a situation where half of them are saying, man, this institution just hasn't worked out. Why would I join that? Right? This is a pretty powerful change in attitudes towards marriage that we've witnessed. And as we can see here, it's largely based on kind of educational attainment or social class or whatever measure you want to put in there. But this is worth noticing that most of us, we're here, we're college educated. The circles we run in Marriage is largely still alive and well. The people we want around with support it, they favor it, they engage in it, they participate in it, but that's not true of all subsets of America. So what are the causes of family decline? Well, there's multiple. We've had some social causes that we've talked about. We've had this huge growth in individualism that life is all about me, are my needs being met? Am I satisfied, am I happy? Well, that's had some, obviously you'd expect that would have some negative effects on a family, where families engender sacrifice, families engender putting the needs of kind of the group over the needs of the individual. We've had the sexual revolution, where the norms regarding sexuality have totally changed. Uh, we've had the redefinition of gender. I mean, this is largely a very recent event that we talk about these things. It just didn't come up. 30 years ago for most of America. But now, it's in all of our popular media. There are discussions we're having every day. I find it fascinating that they'll take surveys and they'll say, what percent of the population would you think is GLBT? And some studies have shown that the median answer is 20 to 25 percent. So you have a good share of America thinking, wow, that's, that's 20 to 25 percent of America when it's never been more than about 3 to 4 percent. But you wouldn't guess that looking at popular media, right? You would think that, and this is a really large group in society. Oh, and then just lastly, we've had kind of the loss of moral authority. For people to come in and the ability for institution and others to kind of say, you might want to rethink your behavior. It's not helping. We don't like when people do that, right? So I'll give you an example from one of my friends. She's at a movie theater and it was the last theater, so the movie theater is largely closed when they get out. But you had the kind of the candy aisle there, and she sees this young teenager, probably 13 or 14. He jumps over the counter, and he just starts helping himself to all the candy, right? So she kind of says, hey, to the mom, you might not want to let your kid do that. And the mom just started chewing her out. Who are you to judge my son? How do you know we didn't pay for that? How do you know? So we're kind of in this situation now where it's really socially taboo to kind of reprimand somebody else's child for bad behavior. But culturally, I think we've all kind of experienced that, that you don't want someone else correcting your kids or you're hesitant to correct somebody else's kids. It didn't used to be that way, right? The society, others had kind of some moral authority to be able to step in and correct bad behavior for the good of society, right? But that's kind of diminished. So there's been some technological changes as well that have impacted the family. Obviously, the birth control pill separated 
intimacy and sex from, from long-term committed relationships. In vitro fertilization is a big one. This one's striking to me because in America, there really aren't many requirements for getting in vitro fertilization. Basically, if the check clears, you can do it. What a lot of people aren't aware of is that there's a number of countries in Europe that still limit in vitro fertilization to married couples. The US is kind of one of the most open when it comes to in vitro fertilization. We are kind of outliers. Now everybody else is kind of catching up with America on these trends, but America very early on was kind of an outlier with being as open as they are with in vitro fertilization. And then lastly, I think most of us in the room would recognize that internet pornography is clearly having an effect on family relationships. So there's been some political and legal developments throughout time that have had an impact on the family. A big one being no-fault divorce. That now couples could say, we just have irreconcilable differences. We don't get along, and that's grounds for divorce. That's a big change. Now what it used to be wasn't, for a lot of groups, not necessarily ideal either, where you had to demonstrate abuse, abandonment, right, alcoholism and other things. But it, so I think most of us would agree that it's good that we've kind of moved away from that, but the pendulum may have swung too far to no-fault divorce where one of the partners can just say, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy anymore, so I want out. I can break the contract just because I, I don't like it, right? And then lastly, there's been some welfare policies. We've put in supports to help largely single moms, but in many cases, this has created a pretty sizable tax to marry. So what does that look like? You can have a couple that's together, they might have children, but they can qualify for certain benefits not married, whereas if they did marry, then they'd have to count their incomes together. They may no longer qualify for benefits. So they can look at this and they can say, man, it's in our economic best interest to not marry. So we have to recognize that that is likely to have had an effect on families over time. And then lastly, there's been a lot of economic effects. Uh, one is assortative mating. Usually when I say that, people say, well, what does that even mean? I, tell me about what that is. Well, over time in America, they've tracked this. If you have a college degree, you want to marry someone else with a college degree. And so that's becoming increasingly likely that the college educated marry the college educated, the middle educated marry the middle educated, and the low educated marry each other. So that's also led to some economic disparity. We talk a lot about income inequality in America. And part of that, I don't want to say all, but a good share of that is driven by assortative mating, where the, the well-to-do marry the well-to-do, and the less well-to-do date the less well-to-do, and some do marry, but it's rare. Uh, men's declining labor force opportunities. Again, I think you'll hear these arguments a lot, and they are genuine, that in many ways, especially men on the lower educational spectrum, have a harder time providing for families uh, you know, than they have in the past. So there was a frontline special I think it was run two years ago, but they followed these families in the 1980s, young working class families. And both mom and dad had, so they followed this one family, I believe it was in Wisconsin. They both had pretty good factory jobs. And they were talking about how, I think they were making like $17 an hour each of them. So then you fast forward to 2012, so this is 30 years later, they're divorced, but dad's applying for these jobs and he's excited because he's got an interview for a job that's making eight fifty an hour. So you look at that, that's not even accounting for inflation, and his salary's kind of been halved. So I don't want to make too much of that, but I think we do have to recognize that that has also played a role in the decline in family, and some of this is the decline in real wages among the working class. And lastly, we have to look at, along with this, are declines in religion, that we've got growth in those that have no religious affiliation, but we've also got declines in those that attend church at all. And what's surprising about this, what a lot of people don't realize, is that religion is actually the strongest among the most educated. It's the most educated that are most likely to be attending church weekly. We don't tend to think about that, but the data bears it out. The least likely to be in church are the poorest and least educated among us. And so that you kind of see these institutions of marriage and religion that are both good positive institutions one subset of the population participates at a fairly high rate in both of those, and other subsets of the population don't. 
So anyway, I just cite that as that's another force that's kind of driving this decline in the family. So I just want to put this up here as an example. Here's average personal income for 25 to 50 year old men, again by quintile. So we divide the economic group up into fifths, right? And you can see there's pretty large disparities in 1970 among this group. These are all in 2010 dollars, just to make it consistent. But you roll forward 40 years, and you do see that the top quintile is doing even better. And there's been some decline in the fourth quintile, a bit of decline in the middle quintile. But then you look at the bottom quintile and you say, wow, the median income is $4,000. Now that's largely because a lot of these men are not in the labor force at all, right? So they've got zero earnings, if not negative earnings. But I can tell you, when we've talked about marriage kind of declining among the poor, I've got three daughters, and if one of them were to come home and say, Dad, I met this guy. He makes $5,000 a year, right? That I would probably discourage them. Honey, that might not be the best match for you. Just, just saying, right? Like, let's, let's talk about this. So that's worth considering that men, 25 to 50, in that bottom quintile, there is something to be said to that argument of they might not be the most marriageable. Now, I don't want to take that argument too far, but we should acknowledge that it's real, that there's something to be said for that. So why does all of this matter? Well, there's a lot of individual benefits to marriage. Married people have better physical health, they have better mental health, they accumulate more financial wealth, they're safer. And by safer, I typically mean they face less domestic violence, but they also live in safer neighborhoods because they have more money but they tend to live longer and they're happier. Now research has demonstrated all of these benefits. And yes, there's some selection effects that, well, those who are able to marry, they're kind of nicer, better, kinder, better people overall. That's true. But even after accounting for that, you see that marriage comes with kind of this bag of goods to the individual. Communities benefit from marriage, right? Because married individuals move less often. Married individuals are more likely to own their own homes. Married individuals are more involved in the community. If you're trying to build, if you could start from scratch and build the city, most city planners would say, man, the best thing for us would be if we could get a lot of married couples to come in and create a stable environment, right? And you see that. That's why communities or states have a vested interest in saying, wow, we want to promote marriage because where we have high concentrations of married people, things seem to be a little better. There's benefits of two married biological parents for children, right? Children raised in this family structure tend to be safer, less domestic violence, less abuse. They have better mental health. They perform better in school. They're less likely to serve time in prison or more likely to graduate from college or less likely to have a child out of wedlock. Now, again, you could say, well, how much of that's a result of both their parents having a college degree and higher incomes? That definitely plays a role, right? But it doesn't explain all of the difference. So I just want to put this slide up. This is the growing divide in income between married and unmarried families from 1980 to 2012. And this is in constant 2012 dollars. The middle line is kind of the average for all families with children. But the bottom line, this is families headed that are you know, headed by an unmarried couple or a single parent. And at the top is married parents. So you look at that and you say, wow, children in married couple households they have over three times the family income. And again, that's due to parents' education, parents' better jobs, all these other things. But you have to look at that and say, this is children growing up in two different worlds. Now, I'm not here to say that just by marrying, these people will triple their income. Right? I don't think anybody's making that argument. But you can see now why a government would look at this and say, wow, we've got a vested interest here in possibly promoting marriage because it tends to stabilize all sorts of things, and it's especially important for resources available to children. So I know this has been kind of depressing, because all the trends are negative, right? So I want to end with just a few reasons for optimism. The first is, there's a group uh, monitoring the future. They do a survey every year for high school seniors, and they ask them, which of these are important to you? And one of the items they ask is having a good marriage and family life. And so let's look at the percent of high school seniors that say, this is extremely important to me. 
Despite all these changes in the family, this hasn't changed. Despite all these negative trends, 80% of the female high school seniors are saying, man, this is extremely important to me to have a good marriage and family life. And it's still north of 70% for these high school men. Now, they may be defining that a, a little differently, right? What does a good marriage and family life look like to them? But this is still, to me, pretty good news. The high school students are still saying, man, this is extremely important to me that I do this well. And that hasn't changed despite all these other negative trends with regard to the family. Another reason for optimism is this is teen births, right? This is the teen birth rate in America. It's at a historic low, and it keeps going down. This is huge news. This is fantastic, right? Like this is, we're doing very well at limiting teen births. Now I do want to qualify this. So this is another one of those confusing slides, but this is the same general trend. The yellow bar is the percent of teen births that are outside of wedlock. So sure, we had, you know, in what is that, 1950s or so, almost, you know, three and a half times the rate of teen births, but the majority of those births were married in 1950. So you fast forward now, right, less than 12% of births to teens are married births now. So I view this overall as a fairly positive trend. We keep bringing these teen births down, we're lowering at least, for teen, at least for that age group, the percent of children born out of wedlock. So again, this is good news, but you'll notice something. This is good news again among teenagers. So I'm optimistic for the future because largely we're seeing some pretty good results among teenagers. Now, a couple people will say, well, that's because abortions have gone up, right? Well, no, we've got this decline in teen births that coincides with a decline in the teen pregnancy rate and a decline in the teen abortion rate. In fact, of teens that get pregnant, a lower percentage are terminating that pregnancy and abortion than in the past. So that statistic is going down as well. So again, this is, if you're wanting to promote family, this is some good news worth sharing. Uh, there's other good news that I could share with you. I work in the media world, and I thought this year's Super Bowl commercials were fantastic because so many had a very positive pro-family approach, right? Or you have the peanut butter Cheerios commercial with a dad that's not the befuddled idiot, right? That we've had kind of that Ray Romano portrayal of dads for so long, it was great to see, wow, there's a dad that's with it, that's involved with his kids, that's doing a good job. Marketers are out to sell products, right, by and large. So what they've clearly recognized is there's some sentiment in America that's very pro-family, that there's a market there that we can kind of advertise to. There's still a large segment. Coca-Cola's done a great job of this. Toyota's starting to put out commercials that show that dads are great, families are important, marriage is good, right? So I view this as also a very promising trend that people are looking at. So. Just by way of review, the role of the family in society has changed in many ways. The decline in families is measurable, ongoing, and has real effects on society at large, especially children. Family decline is happening largely among the poor and less educated. Not all is bad, and there's several reasons for optimism. So with that, we'll turn the time over for a Q&A. Well, Dr. Stanley and Dr. Wilcox join us as well. If you have a question for either for Dr. Sturgeon or for uh, any of the panel, uh, we'll use our microphone here to the to my left. I guess it would be your right, uh, so that we can make sure that that's in the recording. <laughs> um, just a quick question. I think there was a recent study, at least that I saw, uh, didn't look deeply at it, but about um, secularism and stronger parenting. Yes. I think I'll yep. defer to you on that, Brad. Yeah. Um, so there's a, this new research that was mentioned, um, I think, by a scholar at um, USC 
And he found that um, secular families and secular kids did, did pretty well um, on a number of different outcomes. Um, and I haven't seen this particular study, but I have looked at um, trends in parenting and ideology. And what you see actually is that the most conservative and the most progressive parents tend to be the most engaged with their kids. Um, and what I'm hypothesizing with respect to this new study perhaps is that it's, it's parents who are kind of, because um, I think they were specifically sort of talking about more explicit atheist parents. It's parents who kind of have a real kind of strong world view um, who may be doing, you know, a lot of things to try to advance that with, with their kids in ways that aren't, um, you know, that are, that are good on some important social outcomes. But to step back from that particular study, which got a lot of media attention, as you noted, and to look kind of at the broader story, and we find for most Americans, it's that parents who are um, kind of nominally attending or just irregularly attending um, are less engaged with their kids, um, and their kids are less likely to flourish. So kind of the big story about secularization in America is that today kids whose parents are less engaged on average um, are doing less well. And if you haven't read Robert Putnam's new book, Our Kids, he's got a great section in the end that talks about the benefits of religion um, you know, for kids um, on things like um, depression, delinquency, um, odds of attending college are much higher for kids whose parents are regularly engaged in religious communities. So I, I think it's coming more, more of an outlier story than it is kind of painting what's happening among the Americans who are not regularly religious engaged in America. You mentioned that college-educated parents are more religious on average and are more likely to marry, especially the trends. But is that despite college or because of college? I mean, I've looked at a lot of textbooks that deal with marriage in secular, more secular colleges, and where is the championing of traditional marriage in the college textbooks? I don't see it much. The psychology text will emphasize what's wrong with marriage and dysfunctional marriages so I can be a good therapist. But again, is it because of or despite what they learn in college or the social norms that accompany the typical secular college? And one last thing to uh, restate Charles Murray's uh, statement. Uh, in the last presidential election, Barack Obama and, and Mitt Romney both had very good marriages. Nobody accused them of being a bad father. But why don't they preach what they practice? Uh, what's interesting is when you look at that median age at first marriage, most of America is getting married long after the college years. Well, not long after, but you know, two, three years after they're done with college. So that would lead me to say it's probably despite what they've learned in college. In fact, many kind of view that as, especially for men, kind of the season to sort of sow their wild oats and get all that out. But then there comes a time when they want to settle down, kind of more fully join adult life, for lack of better words, and that's when they begin to settle down and marry. I mean, I could defer to either view on that. But I think in the college story, too, one thing that, I mean, I think you're right, in, in the college um, classrooms, you don't necessarily find a lot of positive material on marriage. Um, that's, that's to be sure. But we have to think, too, about the larger ecological context of college life. Um, and if you look at how young adults in American colleges are connecting now to religious organizations on campus. It could be LDS, it could be evangelical, it could be Catholic, um, it could be Jewish, you know, Muslim, whatever. Um, there are a lot of religious resources today on college campuses, um, including, you know, secular public and private institutions. And um, so they are getting access to those institutions and their messages and their influence. And if you think about young adults who are transitioning from high school into a job working in a factory or a McDonald's or somewhere else, they're not being served by those institutions. Um, so I think we have to think about the college experience you know, in a variety of ways. And one, again, big difference today is that colleges have a lot more religious activity for young adults than um, what you would see for young adults who are not on the college track. We'll do one more question with this session. Um, I just had a question about specifics that would help middle and lower income America. Um, Robin Wilson was recently talking about 
the lack of military involvement among that lower group. And I don't know, Sam, if you or Brad have specific insights about what would help there. Because there's anxiety about just encouraging women to marry men who are not going to be helping. And, and that it becomes another child and liability, in a sense, can feel that way. But it's hard to know how welfare would help when it's also created some problems. Anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. I, don't, I, don't, I wish there was a simple solution. Uh, because there are trade-offs faced in all, all sorts of different things. Um, so I know we've been experimenting with that at Boncom, kind of looking at what are the messages that target sort of this working class middle of America with regard to marriage. And the fascinating thing is most people still aspire to marry. <laughs> they just, for whatever reason, feel like they lack the skills or even the resources to make it happen. But the vast majority still want it. So I think, part of me thinks there's, there's got to be a sizable education component there. You know, sort of this idea of you're ready enough to get married, right? The bar may not be as high as society would tell you. But uh, yeah, beyond that, I think that's, that's a wonderful question that we need to better understand. And hopefully we will with more research in the coming years. Just to add a comment that relates to some things that uh, Sam said initially about the, the idea of pointing out things that work well or don't work so well for people and that many people perceive that as being mean or not part of your, your business to point that out to somebody else. I do think, uh, and, and everybody up here is pretty involved in this in different ways, I think you can be a lot more effective at messages than people often are. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways you can explain to people how some uh, place where they do have a choice could make a difference downstream for them. And, you, and if you can educate them, and you can do that in a way that's sort of not, uh, not putting them down, really respecting who they are and that they're an agent of choice, I think, I think there's a real possibility there. Uh, and I also think, and, and I have this debate fairly often with uh, liberal colleagues, it comes up a fair, a fair amount of the time, where people really believe that people in poverty, I, if you look at all of what people say, and I know this isn't what they would say if you make it this naked, but if you really look at a lot of the messages, uh, people tend to believe that people in deep poverty can't do anything for themselves. And, uh, and that are going to need an external rescue. Everything is external. And I think the external context is immensely important and governs a lot of what goes on for people in terms of their behaviors and even their family behaviors. So sometimes I think conservatives underweight the context and the importance of it. Uh, but having said that, it goes too far when you convey to somebody that there's nothing actually you can do to help your own life. You need to wait for us to come around and do it for you. And I think that's a substantial mistake. And I think about it in terms of uh, playing cards in, a, uh, in, in this way. If you think about the metaphor that people are dealt different hands in lives, many people in this room got dealt a really great hand, you know, in terms of family and stability and, and opportunity in terms of education. A lot of people in America get dealt really crummy hands, you know, so some of us are getting 14 cards and some of us are getting two. Uh, but where I think the mistake often is in reasoning is a lot of people think that the person that got two cards can't do anything. When in fact, if you think about it conceptually, it matters actually even much more for that person how they play the two cards that they got. Yeah, they didn't get 14. That's not right. And it would be great if we could help them get more cards. Brad's uh, one of the people on the leading edge of really thinking about that. But it also makes sense to think about how can we help you play the cards that you did get the best way possible for your situation. And if we're not even thinking about that, then there's not a chance of sort of getting to people with that best message about the lever that they can pull. Join me in thanking our panel, in particular Dr. Sturgeon, for getting us started this morning.